So yesterday I moved 10 more outside. Just slowly moving strong ones out. They're going crazy because they want me to feed them. This is what they do. Dog pile. That's their instinct, you guys. It's the dog pile. Um, it is really warm in there. I like stuck my head in because I felt the I felt the heat coming out. And I stuck my head in and was like, "Whoa, it's crazy warm in here." Some happy little birdies. I just noticed someone is getting a red. Oh, there it is. This one. Where is it? This one right here. Male, I think, definitely is starting to get really a red comb and red facial, like, what are those called? Waddles? I'm not sure what they're called. Anywho. There's some happy baby birds. You guys are going to run out of space in here, too. All right, I'm going to go get, get this full for them. Okay, folks. Welcome back. Um, I'm going to be in here for the next few minutes. Sho shoveling some shavings out of the brooder here because it's just getting too tall. Chickens want to escape. <laughs> so I figured I would talk at you guys while I do this. So one of the reasons I'm doing this, like I said, is to make it so that the bedding isn't so high along the walls because the birds can, they're getting to the age where they can jump and bounce out and stuff. So I found a couple trying to roost on the edges a couple times. Why? What? Was that? That's a kid. That's a kid. Come on in. I'm cleaning up stuff. Um, but the other reason is because really spongy bedding um, sorry, the lighting is so bad. Really spongy bedding isn't good for the development of the legs. Honey, no, it's poopy. You can't ride it and I need you to be quiet or you need to go out of here. Um, really spongy bedding isn't good for the leg development of meat, well, any breed of, any birds really, poultry, waterfowl. Um, really spongy bedding isn't good for the development of legs, but it's especially um, an issue for waterfowl like ducks and geese but also for meat birds because they have that higher meat to bone ratio and they just, oh, there we go. Good job. They just generally have a harder time with their development of their hearts, their, um, and their legs. Uh, just, they, they can't, their legs and their hearts can't keep up with the rapid rate of growth that these birds experience. So, um, another reason why I'm taking some of the bedding out, is, out of here is because it's so spongy that uh, last week we only had one bird. Hold on, honey. Last week we only had one bird with a leg problem. Now we have three, I think, which is disappointing. But it's all just part of this um, this process. Um, I've had them with leg problems before and be fine and make it all the way to harvest. The other problem that we're having though, um, which is why I moved some birds out the other day and I've been progressively moving birds out more and more every day, is because of lack of ventilation. and. Um, this is just a learning, this is a really, really good time to learn because, okay, so memory card change. Now we're back. Okay, so we have never brooded chickens inside like this. Um, in the past, meat chickens I'm talking about, we did, ha we have had some egg laying chickens like brood in the, in buildings or garages, houses with us at times, uh, like a small amount, you know, in like a in like a trough or whatever, but we've never brooded this amount of birds in an indoor like still air space. So this is a learning experience for me. We had them in an open air barn. We had them in an open air carport with no top. Like they had lights and they were protected from the rain, but we have always had them outside. So we never had to worry about ventilation. Um, ventilation is a serious thing I have now figured out because a couple of our birds got ascites, or it's basically heart failure, which is really sad to say, but this is another thing 
where these birds' hearts, their growth rate, they can't keep up with their rate of growth. Their heart just has a hard time. And um, generally they do fine. They just breathe really heavily and they don't walk around a lot when they're towards harvest. So they need to be out in the fresh air. That's a really big thing for the health of these birds. I didn't know it was gonna be a problem, but it is. So another reason that we gotta just work a little harder and fix the mistake. And having less birds in here helps a lot. So um, we're just gonna keep taking more out progressively and try to get it aired out in his hair as often as we can. This is one reason why the big like industrial chicken farms like um, they have these big huge ventilation systems fans because the birds don't ever go outside. Yeah. They're not in fresh air, they're in big like concrete houses basically. But it pushes all the air out because this is why. So, maybe another reason why getting heritage breed birds like Freedom Rangers for meat would be a better option because they probably don't have the same problems as these birds do. I mean, I know they don't, but, um, you know, in my, in my past experience, I didn't have um, the same things to deal with now. I'm just learning, learning new things because I have different circumstances now. So, it's okay. We're doing good. <laughs> We're gonna get through it. Okay, what is up friends? So I had a friend on Instagram that I've kind of been almost mentoring, I would say. Uh, it's kind of weird to hear myself say that, but I don't really know what other word would describe it because uh, I've never like necessarily, sorry for the lighting, never really necessarily been like a mentor person for farming or homesteading or like food growing. But I do like to talk to people and encourage them and tell them what I have done and give them suggestions. Um, and so she decided to jump into the meat chicken thing with her husband. They're gonna buy their first little batch of meat chickens uh, this month or maybe next week. And um, so she was asking me some things on Instagram and I figured that I would share them here too because it's pretty valuable information, I guess. Um, about what I'm feeding the chickens and stuff like that. So um, right now I have my chickens on this brand. This is Nature's Best Organic Feeds. So back in Central Oregon, there was a company called Haystack Naturals and it's a local feed mill. And I always really try to support the local companies first because I think that's really important. Um, to support the, the little guy and to just buy locally. Um, now, the folks with that company, they were trying as hard as possible to provide non-GMO grains. Now, um, that's not like all of their grains necessarily or like 100% of all of it, but they were making a solid effort to source and grow themselves as much non-GMO grains as possible for their feeds. And I really support that. Um, I think that's awesome. I do think that there should be something said about how organic and non-GMO can be like really a marketing tactic for a lot of companies. Those companies don't actually have to provide 100% of their product being, um, they don't have to have 100% of it non-GMO or organic. Like if you actually dive deep into the USDA organic certification, like not everything has to be 100% organic going in there for them to call it that. that. So. Um, <laughs> so, so I do, um, I do like to support those companies that are trying their best and maybe can't pay for that certification because it's really expensive to be USDA certified or non-GMO project verified. And so sometimes people will label it differently because they can't put that on there. They'll say, produce with non-GMO ingredients or whatever, or they'll have some other sort of um, stamp. Back in Oregon, they had something called Oregon Tilth that was like an organic certification that you didn't necessarily have to be like USDA certified organic to call it organic. Um, that word has kind of been captured, I feel like. So I do try to support those small companies. Now, that was kind of long-winded, but I have had a really hard time finding a a feed mill like that here. We're in South Dakota, so pretty much all of the grains that are produced in South Dakota are GMO grains. Um, and that's not to say that GMOs are necessarily a bad thing. I just, for personal preference and for what 
we want to feed our animals and what we want to eat ourselves. We just try to, we prefer to make um, our home produced food as non-GMO as possible. So, um, but that's not always something that you can find. I've had a really hard time trying to find like a local feed option. So I'm stuck with things like this, which is a really big name brand. This comes from a creamer. So it comes from Creamer Feed. Creamer Feed is a company, I think out of Pennsylvania. Um, and then there's companies like Scratch and Peck, and then there's, you know, there's a lot of feed options. Um, but I was really trying to avoid having something shipped in because as, um, so I've talked about Justin Rhodes before and Abundance Plus, but his, uh, his streaming platform called Abundance Plus started out as being, um, a, like a paid for member area that he then kind of migrated into being a full on app for streaming and stuff. Um, as a member of that, I ha have access to these discounts to these certain companies and their, um, and their feeds and such. So I will talk about the kelp in a minute that I feed the chickens, which I got from New Country Organics. And I would love to buy all of the feed for the whole process from New Country Organics, but having feed shipped in, the shipping costs are like astronomical right now. And so it's just not like economically responsible for me to do that. And I would really just rather support a local company, but I can't find anything here that's non-GMO, that's locally grown or whatever. Um, all of the big box feed stores here are just supplying the big name corporate feed brands, Neutrina and all of that, which is fine. I just, for my own preference, I would have, I would really like to avoid those GMO company grains and stuff like that for my birds. Um, but it's very expensive. So that bag of feed is a 40 pound bag and it's like $30, which a non-GM or a, a conventional feed bag of feed for 40 pounds would be like $17. So that's a huge um, piece of, that's a huge factor, a huge piece that goes into raising the birds. And um, I do think that raising the birds on pasture um, is still better even if you're feeding them conventional grains. So. That's what I'm feeding the birds currently. And um, I'm hoping that I can ship in the nature's best meat broiler finisher. If not, ship it in from New Country Organics um, if I can. Um, and I still have a couple other places that I'm going to try to search for um, like a kind of more local feed. And like, I'm not so picky that I need something to be certified organic or certified non-GMO free. Like I said, the company I used to support back in Oregon wasn't either of those, but they were making a conscious effort to be a little bit more natural and a little less conventional. So there's that. But I will say that I did, um, I did spring for a, a kelp from um, New Country Organics. It's actually, um, from the company Thorvin, which this is the kelp that Joel Salatin recommends and Justin Rhodes uses on his birds, I think. But I know for sure that Joel Salatin recommends this. Um, I don't ever feed medicated feed to my birds. The kelp will be all the medicine that they'll ever need. Yeah. It provides a supplement for vitamins, minerals, and extra protein. Okay, friends, I was editing video for the next vlog I'm gonna um, upload, and it's from several days ago, but I felt compelled to come on here because it was, um, I've been ending them pretty abruptly. I need to find a better way to like sign off or something, but I felt compelled to um, just pop into this, the end of this vlog, to say, to basically tell you why I'm being so kind of transparent about the problems that we're having. Um, I want more than anything not to sound like a professional because I'm not, I still have a lot to learn, but I think it's valuable to put it out there that you can do these things even if you're kind of fumbling through it and you're having failures. Um, that's how we all learn how to do these things and um, I more than anything just want to give encouragement to people 
and not necessarily, I'm not like a how-to person necessarily, but I just want to show how I have been able to do things and um, how I've been able to overcome obstacles and things and just to show what is possible, that, that it might be tough and there might be things that go wrong, but um, it is possible to learn how to do this. I think it's only natural that we be working with animals in this way. Um, and it's okay when things don't go according to plan. <laughs> we cannot control everything. We can only control what we can control. And so I'm doing my best to control what I can control. And I feel like it's valuable to let you guys in on some of the struggles and realities and just like being honest and uh, transparent. Because more than anything, I just want to show you guys what I'm doing so that maybe you can learn from my mistakes, if anything. So um, I'm going to close the birds up now. And I wish you guys a wonderful evening and we will we'll see you out there. I do want to say also that for educational purposes on my end, I am completely open to constructive conversation and criticism <laughs> um, for any of this stuff. I would love to learn and kind of grow community in the fact of like grow, um, getting to know people that have knowledge about this, um, finding better resources for um, this kind of stuff. I'm already a member of some groups and stuff, but um, I am open to constructive comments and conversation and I would love to hear from you guys if you have any tips or pointers with raising meat chickens. This isn't my first go around, but I'm sure there's still a ton that I have um, yet to learn.